Good morning, church. Good morning. Good morning. How's everybody doing? Tired? If they said that on Facebook this morning, if there's one day you bring your pastor a coffee, it's today. <laughs> where, where, where was my coffee? <laughs> Thanks, Gwen. A bit late now. Yeah, Actually, late. some of you know I never drink coffee before a service, so that's fine. Um, it's, uh, it's tough, but I've been away in a really cold part of the country for last week where the hour was already an hour change. So to come back, it was actually not bad for me, um, which, is, which is nice. And I also wonder how many people today will turn up at 11 o'clock thinking uh, that they are uh, in time for the service. That's always a fun game to play. Anyway, let's have some announcements, shall we? In your bulletin, if you pick one up, uh, I mean... Putting through Lent, I'm putting a leaflet which just talks about Lent. Uh, so each week you'll have one of those, just some information about, uh, about Lent. Grab that, read that through. And also at the back, there are some Easter service flyers. They're big ones, so you put them on the fridge, they'll probably take up quite a bit of your fridge. But they'll tell you when the Easter services are. Uh, take another one of those, give it to your friends as well. So let them know. Uh, what we're doing for Easter. Uh, some other um, announcements. This Tuesday is uh, our church council meeting. Please be praying for that. And uh, the next week on Sunday, we're going to be having a church vote um, for uh, the Royal Family Church, who are going to be, they're very started here. That's Pastor Matthew Cephas's multi ethnic service. They, they have their congregation at 1145. Oh, thanks for Lane. Good, good point. I should have given you the clicker. Um, but next week, we're going to be voting not just to be good neighbours, but actually to begin a, a partnership uh, with them. Uh, really just to be opening our doors uh, so that they can be here and they can call <coughs> this home. Uh, if you've got any questions about that, then please uh, talk to myself or one of the council uh, members. I actually... Um, on this conference last week, and part of it was a very big conference, and then the other part was uh, with uh, our district. Uh, I, I spent time with Matthew, uh, Matthew Cephas was there, and uh, we were able to chat together. And one of the interesting things, Matthew came, uh, of course, from Liberia. His wife and two kids came earlier on, and um, before the war had ended, Matthew stayed there uh, and uh, really walked through some, some conflict areas each day to be at his church, to be there praying, and then people would turn up and pray. And he grew a church there from almost nothing to, to thousands. Um, and so that was a rent for him to leave. And so um, he, he came back three weeks after his wife and kids came when the war was ending. Uh, but Matthew told me he arrived in this country, him and his wife arrived in this country, with $100 to their name. Hmm. And that is it. And I said, did you get any help? Did you get any support? And he said, no. If they come as refugees, they would have done. But because they came with a different visa, they started with $100. And it makes us think that um, <laughs> the little bit we can do of welcoming people into our church, especially those multi-ethnics come from different uh, places and countries, uh, that's an awesome opportunity. But, um, you know, that, uh, that really shook me that that's what they had to uh, come with and, and you know we're looking at the news and we're going to pray later on for those in Ukraine who are now refugees one and a half million of them spreading out around Europe uh, and when we see the pictures and our hearts are touched we need to turn that into prayer people who have left everything behind um, and don't know what what the future holds so we're going to uh, just have a time of quiet as we recognize we've come into the Lord's presence and then we're going to hear uh, a song from Carmen and Angie. This is my father's world. And then we'll begin our service. So I'd invite you now just to close your eyes a moment. We we'll close our eyes so that we're not distracted from those things around us. And we recognize that we're here in church. We're in God's house. We ask him to, to be with us.
So Father God, thank you for bringing us to church today. Lord God, we pray for your presence here. We pray, Father God, for an outpouring of your Holy Spirit upon this place. Lord God, we ask you to come and be with us here that we may receive you in the sacrament and through your word that we may grow in our faith, Father God, and built up in our relationship with you as we sing your praises and as we pray to you and listen to your voice. Bless us now, we pray. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. And so our worship this morning begins in the way our lives in Christ in baptism began. In the name of God the Father, and God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's listen to this song and allow the Lord to, to speak to us. This is my Father's world, and to my listening ear, all nature sings and round me ring the music of the sphere. This is my Father's world, I rest me in the thought of rocks and trees, of skies and seas, his hand the wonders wrought. This is my Father's world. The birds their carols raise, the morning light, the lily white, declare their Maker's praise. This is my Father's world, He shines in all that's fair. In the rustling grass I hear him pass He speaks to me everywhere This is my Father's world Oh, let me not forget That though the wrong seems oft so strong God is the ruler yet. This is my Father's world. Why should my heart be sad? The Lord is King. Let the heavens ring. God reigns. Let the earth be glad. This is my Father's world, the Lord Jesus has come, and though I'm wrong, my sins are gone, the Lord has set me free. Thank you come to our time of confession and our, our time through Lent is, is a journey and I don't know what you're doing uh, as part of that journey if, if anything whether you've decided to uh, take something up or put something uh, down through Lent but as we journey through Lent we're journeying towards the cross we're journeying towards that time of Easter when we remember what Christ has done for each one of us and so we come in confession, knowing that the Lord God hears us, and he longs to reach out to us, his children, to clothe us in his compassion and in his love. And we're going to hear later on how God is patient with each one of us, no matter how many times we mess up. So there's some words on the screen, I'm going to read the L part, if you could uh, <coughs> join me with the C. On this second Sunday in Lent, we're reminded the Lord is rich in mercy and willing to forgive our sins and save us by His grace. But we're not always ready 
to approach him in the humility of faith and with the heart of repentance. From the prophet Jeremiah comes the story of how the word of the Lord was met with rejection, anger, and rebellion. In Philippians, Paul reminds us that even as we live here on this sinful earth, we're also citizens of heaven. In the gospel, we hear the lament of the Lord who wanted to gather his people under the arms of his mercy, but they would not. Let us call upon our God rich in mercy and confess to him our sins. There is a certainty in our spirits today, O Lord. We feel that the journey on which we have embarked will demand too much of us. There are so many other things in our lives which claim our spirits, our energy, our hopes and fears. It is easy to be like Jerusalem in our gospel reading, turning our backs on those whom you sent. The world shouts its solutions to us and then deserts us when we are in need. Forgive, Forgive us, us for, for the many times in which, which we have strayed from your pathway of life, when, when we have chosen not, not to hear the cries of those in need, when we have belittled the gifts and skills you have you've given us in order to avoid serving others. In short, short, Lord, we have not lived as citizens of heaven. heaven. Heal, Heal us, O Lord. Lord. Place, Place us back on your path of heavenly citizenship. For we, we ask, ask this in Jesus' name. name. Amen. And we will be reminded in our readings and sermon later on that God is indeed patient with each one of us. And so we know that when we come to God and say, Lord God, I'm sorry that I keep messing up. God is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and he will cleanse us from all of our unrighteousness. So brothers and sisters know this today, that because of our confession, because of what Jesus Christ has done for each one of us, that I can declare to each one of us that it's because of Jesus that our sins are forgiven. In the name of God the Father, and God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Amen. We're going to sing a song, Christ is our cornerstone. We're going to be thinking about that later on, how our lives are built upon Christ. If you're able to, please stand with me as we sing together. Rebecca's going to come and bring us our reading in a moment. Two readings, one from Isaiah and then one from 1 Peter. And the one from Isaiah, again, I'm going to pick up later on, but it's the prophet Isaiah talking about a vineyard that the Lord God is going to plant. But unfortunately, people don't hear the message of the prophet. And that means there will be destruction of that vineyard, the prophet Isaiah 
foretells. And then the, the, the reading from 1 Peter will pick up on the second part of our Gospel reading about a stone, a cornerstone. And you see the second part when you're listening. Uh, Peter will talk about us being a chosen race, a royal priesthood. I mention that because uh, the African church, Matthew Cephas' church, is called Royal Family. And it's from those words there, the royal priesthood, that they got that name. Thanks, Rebecca. Old Testament lesson. The vineyard of the Lord destroyed. Let me sing for my beloved my love song concerning his vineyard. My beloved had a vineyard on a very fertile hill. He dug it and cleared it of stones and planted it with choice vines. He built a watchtower in the midst of it and hewed out a wine vat in it. And he looked for it to yield grapes, but it yielded wild grapes. And now, O inhabitants of, inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, Judge between me and my vineyard. What more was there to do for my vineyard that I have not done in it? When I looked for it to yield grapes, why did it yield wild grapes? And now I will tell you what I will do to my vineyard. I will remove its hedge, and it shall be devoured. I will break down its wall, and it shall be trampled down. I will make it a waste, it shall not be pruned or hoed, and briars and thorns shall grow up. I will also command the clouds that they rain no rain upon it. For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel, and the men of Judah are his pleasant planting. And he looked for justice, but behold, bloodshed, for righteousness, but behold, an outcry. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Epistle lesson from First Peter. As you come to him, a living stone rejected by men, but in the sight of God, chosen and precious, you yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For it stands in Scripture, Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone chosen and precious, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. So the honor is for you who believe, but for those who do not believe, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone and a stone of stumbling, and a rock of offense. They stumble because they disobey the word as they were destined to. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thanks, Rebecca. So our gospel reading carries on where we were in Mark, and uh, the sharp ones among you will see that we've skipped out a Mark chapter 11. That is actually about the, uh, the triumphal entry, Palm Sunday, which we will have uh, in a few weeks' time. Uh, so we move on in Mark, Mark chapter 12. Today we're hearing about the parable of the, ta- of the tenants. So the Holy Gospel according to St. Mark. Glory to you, O Lord. And Jesus began to speak to them in parables. A man planted a vineyard and put a fence around it and dug a pit for the wine press and built a tower and leased it to tenants and went into another country. When the season came, he sent a servant to the tenants to get from them some of the fruit of the vineyard. And they took him and beat him and sent him away empty-handed. Again, he sent them them another servant, and they struck him on the head and treated him shamefully. And he sent another, and him they killed. And so with many others, some they beat and some they killed. He still had one other, a beloved son. And finally, he sent him to them, saying, they will respect my son. But those tenants said to one another, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him, and the inheritance will be ours. And they took him and killed him and threw him out of the vineyard. What will the owner of the vineyard do? He will come and destroy the tenants and give the vineyard to others. Have you not read this scripture? 
The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing, and it was marvelous in our eyes. And they were seeking to arrest him, but feared the people. For they perceived that the, he had told the parable against them. So they left him and went away. This is the gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. So it seems I am to, to sing the church's one foundation. If you're able to, please stand as we sing together. Take your seats. And as we come to hear God's word, will you pray with me? Father God, thank you for the privilege it is to gather here together today in peace and tranquility, able to come and hear your voice. Father God, I pray that you may be with us now through your Holy Spirit. Speak to us through your word. Grow us in our faith, we pray. Draw us closer to you. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So, so we're going through Mark's Gospel. We're thinking about patience today. And really, a question for us, how patient are you? How patient are you? How patient maybe are other people with you? That might be a better question. Uh, as you know, I went to Orlando last week on this conference and I tell you, I'm, not, I'm, I'm usually reasonably patient, okay? But my patience was trying, especially when you're, you're in the airport and you see all these uh, flights being cancelled or delayed. And so my, ours was delayed. And we finally got on the plane at about 9 o'clock in the evening, which means we arrived in, in Orlando at about 1 o'clock in the morning, which, you know, tiredness just tries your patience a little bit, right? And then, of course, we have to go and get a rental car. So by the time we get to the rental car place, it's 2 o'clock in the morning. And yet, you guessed it, um, it seems that if you were in Avis, you are fine. They had a long line of people. But the company we were with decided to close at 12 o'clock. So that tries your patience a bit more, right? You know, I, you can see, you can have sympathy for me, okay? Maybe. But needless to say, I wasn't very patient. But... That's life, right? Jesus, in our parable today, he's going to, to tell us that God is actually patient with each one of us. God, God is so 
patient with us. And we'll know for ourselves how much uh, we're aware that, that God is just, he's, he's patiently there each time we, we just walk in the opposite direction. Patience when, when we mess up, patience when we go our own way. Golly me, God is patient. Just some background. So in medieval England, you'd have uh, a lot of uh, farm laborers, tenants, who would farm the land for the rich landowner, okay? Uh, and uh, what they would do is, in return, they would give a proportion of the fruits of their labors or, or some of the money that they had uh, received from selling the fruits of their labors. And this, this goes on still uh, in parts of England, and it still happens in, in parts of the world as well. So remember this tenancy thing, because that's what our parable is about. As so the landowners were pretty common in Jesus' day also. Uh, a wealthy person would buy some land and then put some tenants on the land to, to farm it. Uh, it's like an investment, uh, and it's sort of a win-win, if you like. And Jesus is going to present this parable actually to these religious leaders. And you think, well, that's odd, because religious leaders aren't going to be landowners, are they? Well, actually, in some ways they are, because God has given the religious leaders, both through Isaiah before Christ came and now still at the time of Christ, God has given these religious leaders the land, Israel, to farm, to produce fruit, to produce followers. And there had not been good tenants. And Jesus is going to tell this story and he's going to reveal to them how much he's aware of what they're thinking and doing. Actually, their plot to kill him. And so Jesus uses a, a well-known theme, well-known passage that we've had, Isaiah 5, from the Old Testament. Uh, and it was a prophecy about a vineyard of the Lord. It's actually a, a love story, if you read it. A love story where God is, is, is showing his love for his people and all that he's doing for them. How the Lord plants this vineyard and, and puts people in, over it to watch over it, to produce good grapes. Uh, and in our passage, and in the Isaiah passage, just to break it down for you, the owner, of course, is God. The vineyard is Israel. God's people as well. And, and the things like the wine vat and, and the tower and things, well, they're there to show the blessings that God is providing for his people. And then you've got the tenants. Well, for Jesus, they are the religious leaders. In Isaiah, they are the religious leaders as well. And the servants, they're the ones who are sent to the vineyard, the prophets. And then the grapes of the vineyard, that's the fruit Israel was called to produce. God's righteousness, God's people growing up in their faith with other people coming to know him. But sadly, Isaiah and the leaders around the time of Jesus, <laughs> they produced disappointing results, right? Instead of them producing good fruit, they produced wild grapes, Isaiah tells us. In, in dis, despite of God's patience and God's care for them, they'd messed up. Uh, and so, back in the time, in the Old Testament time, there was, as Isaiah and Jeremiah and these other prophets foretold, and we've looked at that, if you remember, they told of a time of judgment when the Assyrians, when the Babylonians would come and take away the northern kingdom, the southern kingdom, and destroy a lot of this, this vineyard, if you like. But God allowed the people to come back. And that this chance, again, through God's patience. And so now we fast forward to Mark's gospel. And Jesus is picking up on this Isaiah 5 passage. But now we've got an addition, if you notice. Because now God would ultimately send his son, his beloved son to the people because he was he was so patient with them but of course his son would be rejected as well the religious leaders have failed to do what god had called them to do <sighs> and 
you look at the look at the servants. I mean, they didn't just fail to do what God had told them to do. I don't know whether you've ever taught this this uh, parable in a Sunday school, but I'm not even sure it's appropriate to do that because we're going to see the horrors unfolding. That there's going to be this escalation of abuse that's going to happen with the people that God will send. The servants are going, you know, ending with with the son, are going to be treated horribly. So the first servant, right? And this is the end, at the end of the first year's harvest. Important to remember that. The first servant is sent. Why is he sent? To go and collect the fruit of the harvest. What happens there? Well, they didn't just, like, send him away. They beat him, right? Seems to go with the territory. But they took everything he had. They took his clothing they were actually showing the owner that the owner owed them. And the only reason why the owner might owe them is, is if the land didn't produce enough, it wasn't fertile enough. Maybe it also shows that they were just plain lazy. The second one, the second servant, and this is the end now of the second year's harvest. The, the, the next servant the situation gets worse. I, I mean, I wonder who would have actually volunteered to go there knowing what had happened to the previous people, knowing the abuse had taken place. And what happens? Yeah, well, they, they beat the guy again. And maybe actually <laughs> the beatings, if you were the slave, you want to be beaten because at least you'd go back to the master and say, look, I'm not in on the plot. I didn't take any of the money. I've got, I've got the, the bruises, the beatings to show for it. But they also did something else. They shamed him. Now this is an honor-shame culture. To shame him, and just shame him in horrific ways. They, think about the statement they were giving the owner of the vineyard. He was showing to everybody their huge disrespect for the owner. <laughs> Do you see what Jesus is saying? to those leaders that he's talking to when he's sharing this parable, how, how they were meant to be caring for God's children, but actually what they thought about God. And, and you can imagine that the leaders were probably turning increasingly red with embarrassment because they remember the first time this parable is told in Isaiah 5 and, and how prophets like Isaiah were ridiculed, were kicked out. Isaiah was probably sawn in half under King Manasseh. And Jeremiah, well, Jeremiah was stoned to death on his way to, Israel, to, to Egypt by some of the Israelites. And they would have known these stories and the words Jesus is saying about these servants getting beaten and sent away would have rung true to them. And yet, all the while, we have these pa this patient owner, God, who, who's enduring this rebellious behavior, hoping that the tenants would come to their senses. But now, actually, the third time around, he's beginning to expect trouble. You can see that he's going to be sending the next slave, but he's going to send him with a number of attendants, bodyguards. But that didn't do much good either, because what happens, well, they actually get killed. And now, because this is the third time, the third season, the tenants, because of the rules they had, are now in a position to claim the vineyard as their own under their law. Because they've given nothing, no fruits, to the last three servants over the last three seasons. No payment means no, it means ownership for them. We might think that's a bit unfair, but that is the rules that they had. Unless, unless the owner can now come along with proof of the original rental agreement to show the tenants aren't the new owners. And there's one more detail. It's a really important detail. Do you see at the beginning that we're told that the owner went abroad? The owner went abroad. If he had been close by and he hadn't claimed his fruits, of the harvest for three years, he would have almost by now have lost it. Okay? But he is 
away. And now he's got another opportunity to claim his rights. What does that mean? He's going to bring his son into the situation. It's the fourth year. It's now vital for him. He's going to make a formal protest. He's going to warn these tenants of legal action. And, and, and in order to do that, he can't send a slave. He's going to send a legal representative. And he's going to transfer the rights of this land onto that representative. His son. His beloved son. Who would now go to the vineyard in possession of the original owner's document. And are you beginning to see a story here? This is exactly what God did for each one of us. This is, this is the gospel message. The God so loved the world that he sent his one and only beloved son. That, that word beloved, Jesus uses that. Uh, the father uses that at Jesus' baptism. And then at the transfiguration. This is my beloved son. Listen to him. This, these words that Jesus was using in this parable are not just plucked out of the air. There's a pattern to them. People will have known a lot of what was going on around them. This is God's last and most gracious attempt in such patience to win over his people. And, and, and how do the tenants respond? How do they respond? Absolutely atrociously. It shows how deeply twisted their hearts are. The solution lies in, in, in killing the son, the owner's rightful representative. So then this land will be theirs. They've kicked out God. And, and you see the, the, the friendly way they talk about it. Come on, let, let's kill him. I mean, they're all acting together. And you think, well, how do they get away with that? Surely somebody would come and hold them to account. That actually would be quite easy for them. Because they could just claim that the, the owner kept pestering them and, and threatening them with violence, so they had to use force. They, they, they thought they were right in doing so. And, and in killing Jesus, the Jewish leaders will say, well, we were right in doing so because we were keeping the law. Because the law being kept would mean the Messiah, God, would come. And, and yet this Jesus guy... Well, he's breaking the law. He's messing things up. He, he's he's going to get the Romans turned against us. So they feel justified in what they were doing. And yet God had been so patient with them, waiting for them to turn back to him. And Jesus will be taken outside the city, killed on a cross. Outside of the city, you see, because the blood of the corpse couldn't be left in the vineyard, in the soil. Otherwise, that soil in the vineyard becomes unpure, you see in our story. So the body is taken outside of the city gate. Jesus was crucified on the hill of Golgotha, outside of the city walls. But we know Jesus, his body, wasn't just dumped on that trash heap at Gehenna. Jesus was taken down and buried in a wealthy person's tomb. And three days later, Christ rose from the grave to conquer death. God is patient with each one of us. He, he, he waits for us. He longs for us to be in a relationship with him because of what Jesus Christ has done. And the leaders, the leaders of the vineyard of Israel, what, what does the, the parable tell us happened to them? They will be destroyed. And we saw that in the Old Testament of what happened with Isaiah's prophecy. And now with this parable of Jesus, they will be destroyed in AD 70. Physically, the Romans would destroy everything. And then spiritually, the destruction. Christ will come. He will take his rightful place at the head of the church. The vineyard will be taken away. It will be given to others. God's mission will be taken away and now be spread out to all people. People like Paul and the disciples spreading out the mission to the Gentiles as well, just as it should have been as Christ, the Messiah, was the light to lighten the Gentiles. And Jesus turns to the religious leaders and he says to them, don't, don't you know this? Don't you know this? And of course, I think they, they did. 
Don't you know this? I mean, the scriptures, which you say you're an expert of, it, it, it talks about this already. You, you've read it, right? The tenants and how they treat the owners and the son. And Jesus turns his finger back on them and says, You are they. You are the ones who are treating these servants badly. You, you've turned against the prophets. You, you turned against John the Baptist. And now you're going to turn against the owner's son. And the leader's response, remembering what Isaiah had said in the Old Testament, this would be a chance for them and the crowd to repent and say, oh, you, you got it. You, you nailed it. We, we, we're wrong. We're going the wrong direction. We repent. No. They realize this is an accusation against them. And they leave. They walk away to go and continue plotting Jesus, the beloved son's death. And then, in our passage, Jesus will then come back to a different verse, a different piece of Old Testament scripture from Psalm 118. Psalm 118, where, where the pilgrims are going towards Jerusalem along with G Jesus. They're going there for this Passover meal. And in Mark 11, we'll pick up on this again, where in the triumphal entry, they will sing these psalms as they come down from the Jericho towards Jerusalem. They'll go to Mount of Olives, they'll come down the hill, and then they'll start walking up that hill, and they see the gleaming white temple at the top of Jerusalem. And they start singing these songs of ascent, including a Psalm 118 as well. And, and the psalm talks about the temple. And it talks about a cornerstone in the temple. And it was first written, Psalm 118, was first written by, by David, King David, who talks about a cornerstone that would be rejected himself, King David, who was first of all rejected. But then he would come to the throne in triumph. But, but the psalm is also a prophecy. It doesn't just talk about King David. It talks, of course, about another king, a future king. And it will bring a little bit of a new meaning to it. Part of the temple is that stone which doesn't fit in really. And which, which the builders, the Jewish leaders, will reject. And yet that stone goes on to be the capstone, the cornerstone. The exactly right dimension stone that everything else will be built around. It's a bit like when you, when you put an arch together. And the last piece you put in is the keystone which holds the whole arch together in place. Jesus is the cornerstone Psalm 118 is pointing towards, and yet he'll be rejected by the chief priests and the leaders. And in rejecting the stone, they reject the Father's plan for them and for God's vineyard, Israel. And then do you see what Mark says at the end? I love this bit. He said, the, the stone that Jesus, of Jesus will be rejected, but it will become the cornerstone. And the psalmist says, this is the Lord's doing, and it's marvelous in God's eyes. Marvelous. I'm sure the psalmist was actually English. It was marvelous. All that God has done through Jesus, it is incredible. When we think of all that God has done in our lives, it is incredible. It's marvelous. When we're coming into church, when we're thinking about the Lord God, how do we respond? With joy, with a smile on our face, knowing that Jesus is the cornerstone. He is the capstone in our lives. He's everything that brings our life together. Have you ever had to train something or someone? Potty training, puppy training. working with children, doing, I'm just having visions now of working with my kids doing potty training. Or even with Fernie, our little dog, trying to get him to, uh, to train, to, to tell us when he goes to the toilet. And some people manage to train their dogs to ring a bell when they want to go out and go to the toilet. I don't know how they ever do that. And you train up your dog so that it won't, I was going to say your kid as well, just that they won't use the nice rug in front of the fireplace or use the corner of the couch to do their business, which is what our dog was doing. But when you do train, potty training, you need two things, right? You need two things. First thing you need is treats. You need a lot, a lot of treats. 
Every time they go to the toilet, you give them a treat. Every time they think they need to go to the toilet, you give them a treat. Every time they like do a little dance, you give them a treat just to encourage them, right? And some of us are sitting there thinking, I need a treat every time I try and go to the toilet. But the other thing you need as well as treats is, is patience. It's really hard just sitting there waiting for a kid on the potty so they'll go toilet or wait for your dog to do his business. Patience. You need patience. Patience to encourage when, when it will be so much easier to pick up the easier option. Just pick them up yourself or kick the dog out, yourself, whatever it is. But you see the owner of the vineyard's patience. Do you see him, him sending people at personal cost to send a warning? Giving people the benefit of the doubt even though they just don't get it? Even though we don't get it? Patience to the point of almost being foolish with people who have not served him well. And yet that's God's character. Patience, even though we don't deserve it. Even when we push God's patience to the point of extreme, when we just don't get it, when we keep messing up, and we keep turning around and going the the other way, and God says, no, follow me. Keep your eyes fixed on me, and we, we think we know better patience with us. Why? Because God is serious about us, his children. God loves us. God is slow to anger and abounding in love. And he still keeps drawing people to himself and keep praying for those people that we know have wandered off away from God because God is patiently waiting for them to come back to him. 2 Peter, another reading, says the Lord is not slow in keeping his promise. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. You see, the tenants, they took God's patience for granted. That they, they abused it. And sometimes I wonder if I have lost sight of how God is patient with me. Have I lost sight of how much God is patient with me? How God is so slow to anger and quick to bless. And and what's our response? Hopefully it's not like the tenants in the story. But instead we see the open arms of God and we run to him in repentance. Lord God, I've been a lousy tenant. I've been lousy with all that you've given me to care for. Whether it's my own self, my own body, or whether it's my gifts and talents that you've given me to use and I've been lousy with that, or my family, or my job, or your world, Lord God. But we come to God and we say, God, I see your patience. Please help me to change. I come to you, Jesus, as the cornerstone of my life. And I want to base my life on you as my rock. Jesus is the cornerstone in our life, the solution on which all our whole life holds together, in which everything else makes sense. And God in his love sent his son to us, his children, to this world that he's created. And for those who look on him in faith, we're no longer ter- tenants or servants, but we're now heirs together of the inheritance the future inheritance and this kingdom of God now and the new heaven and the new earth where God will dwell one day with all his people. Will you pray with me? Father God, thank you for your patience with each one of us. Lord God, we need your patience because we're too often running away. Lord, in your patience, bring us back to you that we might see your open arms and know that you love us, your children. Bless us, Lord, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. As we move on in our service, we're going to come to our Apostles' Creed. It's a creed that we stand and say together as we announce what we believe along with Christians throughout the world. Go over to please stand with me. Let's say these words together. 
I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of God the Father of Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We turn to prayer now. I'd invite you to sit or kneel as we pray. I'd ask for the offerings to be brought forward. And then we're going to have just a short time of praying for the situation in Eastern Europe and then praying for those who are sick and struggling. Let's pray together. Father God, thank you for all that you have blessed us with. Thank you, Lord God, for the gifts that you give us, as well as our time and our talents. We pray that you may use these things to, to further the work of your kingdom, both here and throughout the world. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Now I'm going to invite us uh, in the quiet to pray for the situation in the Ukraine. Maybe you've got images of pictures of some of the things that you've seen. Just going to invite you for a few moments to lift up your own cries of, of compassion to the Lord, asking Him to intervene and bring peace. Let's just pray quietly together now. Father of God, we do indeed cry out to you on behalf of these people groups who are being devastated by war. Father God, we pray for, for, for mothers, for children, for babies, for those who've had to take up arms and fight. Lord God, for those who are refugees, having to leave their homes, not knowing what the future holds. Lord God, we pray for peace. We pray for an end to this conflict. Lord God, we pray for your intervention. Because it doesn't seem that there's any other way that this is going to end, Lord God. And on this day, your day, Father God, we pray for those who are followers of you, that they may have opportunity to stop and to call out to you and to hear your comforting voice with them. God, you are so patient with us, but we pray that you may act in Eastern Europe, Lord God. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. turn now to pray for those people we know of who are sick or struggling at this time. And I invite you again in the quietness to lift up to the Lord those names of people that you know of who need the Lord's touch at this time. As we're lifting up people in prayer today, we do pray today for the family and friends of June Parr, June uh, passed away uh, a couple of weeks ago. Also adding to the list, Jenny's mother, who had a fall and has broken her wrists at the minute. Let's, let's pray for, for Jenny and her mother and the situation. Father God, we do indeed lift up to family and friends of June, and we pray, Lord God, that in their mourning, they may know your comfort. Lord God, we pray for Jenny, our administrator's mother, who's had a fall, Father God, we pray that you may bring her relief and comfort. And Lord God, we pray for your healing hand upon her. Father God, we pray for those people that we know of here. Lift up to Eugene. We pray for Walter, Father God. 
Lift up to you Millie. Pray for Robert and Dolores. Father God, we pray for Mary. Lord God, have your hand upon Barney. Pray for Dorothy. Father God, we continue to pray for our brother Aaron going through his teen challenge treatment. Strengthen him in that. Father God, continue your, to have your healing upon Bev. Father God, continue to strengthen Lil. Pray for Bill. Pray for Father God for our Chuttons. Pray, Lord God, for Evangeline, Rosalind's cousin. Thank you for uh, the, the encouragement, the improvement she's been making. And we continue to pray for your hand upon her. And Lord God, we do pray for Rosalind as well. Pray, Lord God, for job stability for her as she heads into the summer, not knowing what things will bring. Father God, we continue to pray for Rod and Cole. Lord God, we lift up to you Susie. Pray for Bruce and Ashley. Continue your healing hand upon Katie, Lord. Lift up to you Joanne. Continue to pray for good health. Father, for those we know are struggling with cancer, we pray for Kevin. Continue to pray for Gwen's witness to her neighbors, Lord God. Lift up to you, John. Pray for Susan. Father God, we pray for John and, and Paddy as well. Lord God, for, for family members of Gwen, bring your healing upon them, Lord. Lift up to you, Roxy and Amy. Father, pray for Warren. Pray for Wade's friend, Ty, Father God. Lift up to you, Dale and Amy. And Lord God, we continue to pray for those who are first responders, healthcare workers, teachers at this time. And Lord, we also pray for those who are serving our country in challenging areas in the world. Lord, in your mercy. In our prayer. And Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our, our Father, Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our presence as we see those first protections, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from you, for thine is the kingdom, the power of the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Come to our time of communion. I invite you uh, to take up your packs in your hand as I talk us through uh, the liturgy. If you didn't pick up a pack, there are some at the back there. And as we think about this meal, often think, well, why was the wine and the vineyard so important? And if we go back to the first Passover, we see that link between the red wine and the blood, the blood of the sacrificial lamb. And then we heard in our story how God would send his, his son, his beloved son. And we see the parallel between that and Christ dying on the cross shedding his blood as our sacrifice. So Jesus gathers with his disciples, and as they're going through this Passover meal, Jesus is now going to say that the blood is his blood, the wine is his blood, and the bread is his body broken for us, shed on a cross for each one of us. So on the night that he was betrayed, Jesus took bread, and he gave thanks to God, and he broke it, and he gave it to his disciples and said, Take and eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. And then after supper, Jesus took the cup. And he said, drink this all of you. This is the blood of the new covenant, shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of your sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And may the peace of the Lord be with you always. And also with you. I invite you to take up your pack, the side with the wafer on it. Receive the body of Christ broken for you. As you turn it over, this is the blood of Christ shed for the forgiveness of your sins.
Will you pray with me? We give thanks to your mighty God that you've refreshed us through this salutary gift. And we implore you that of your mercy, you would strengthen us through the same in faith towards you and in fervent love towards one another. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. As we come to the end of our service, we're going to sing a song, There is a Redeemer. There is a Son, a beloved Son, who was sent to save each one of us. If you're able to, please stand with me as we sing together. a moment. So we thought today about this parable, the parable of the vineyard. We thought about how God is patient, was patient then, is still patient with each one of us now. And so as we go out into the world, may we know God's patience with us. May we know that we can keep coming back to him no matter what. But let's also remember that now the vineyard is ours to work the land. God has given each one of us the task to be his missionaries, to draw new people in. And so as we go out on our way, let's be praying for those to the left of us, those to the right of us, for our friends and our neighbors, that God may be patient with them. God may use each one of us (coughs) to tell them about the owner of the vineyard. And may the Lord bless each one of us and keep us. May the Lord make his face to shine down upon us and be gracious to us. May the Lord look upon us with favor and give us his peace. In the name of God the Father, and God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Amen.